um, I wanted to bring on one of the most, well, let me put it this way. He's probably the hottest commodity in Silicon Valley right now. <laughs> okay, so I had the distinct privilege of actually meeting him uh, a few weeks ago, uh, but I did see him at Tycon several times. Every year he'd come in and he'd speak, but more than, more than that, he would sponsor the conference. You know, as a hot startup rising and building traction, traveling, you know, all over, slotted time to come and share his views and share his uh, uh, expertise with us. And um, so I won't get into too much of uh, describing this man, uh, mainly because in these days, you know, if, uh, particularly if you guys are here and you don't know who Dhirish Pandey is, then you're in the wrong place, pal. <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, it's not a Google research-driven you know, discussion about this man. You know, I just wanted to tell you what I experienced. So I um, was asked to go and speak with him to invite him to to come in. A, a, you know, and it's my story. Uh, and I, on the way driving up there, my thought was that okay, I'm going to meet this 40-year-old. Probably the guy is uh, you know running on adrenaline and uh, and steroids, and it's got like 15, 20 minutes for me. And he'd come in and uh, he'd say okay, you know, it's got million things on the pipe, and, and which he all had, and the, all of this really was him. But what I didn't expect was just an amazing, refreshing, simple, humble, down-to-earth, brilliant man who really, you know, has very strong opinions about, uh, you know, about uh, values. So we sp spoke for maybe 60, 70 minutes, maybe a little more an hour. Uh, he never looked at his phone. I looked at my phone a couple of times because it was beeping, you know. Uh, but, um, you know, a significant time that he had spent with me, he talked about his family. So he was, a, first of all, a family man. So these are very special traits in, in, uh, in, uh, that you don't normally see in very successful driven entrepreneurs who are so focused in what they're doing. They're talking that in their sleep. They walk into the bathroom thinking about it. They wake up with it, they sleep with it. That's how I've seen driven entrepreneurs. But I've never seen a man like that who's cool and composed, always plugged in, but with that simple side of him that was very special. So I'm pretty sure you'll experience him here you know, in a few minutes uh, when I bring him on. So, uh, but the key to this kind of events, the quality of these people and who they are and how they have gotten where they've gotten, there's a side of learning that doesn't come with domain expertise. That's self-made, and if some of us can learn from those experiences from bringing people like that into Thai programming, that's the big takeaway. So that is the kind of a quiet mentoring that you get every single day at Thai. So without much ado, let me bring on my guest of honor today, Dhirish Pandey. <laughs> After Dhirish finishes speaking, there will be a question and answer session, and uh, in the interest of time, we are going to present the questions on, this, uh, on, on here, and he's going to address them. Uh, but if any of you have any questions, please sign up through the system and add to those questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ram. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And these are my three children and my wife and my mother-in-law. <laughs> And it's a very unique uh, opportunity because I've never spoken in front of them before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be a test for me and the test for them too because you know, they don't realize what the you know, decorum of uh, a talk like this would be. So she's going to keep talking to me actually for the next. <laughs> Maybe some of the Q&A will come from her as well. <laughs> um, yeah, that's my wife, uh, Sapna. And I've been married to her for 17 years now. Uh, my mother-in-law, Vimla, um, you know, she's uh, very much like my mom. She, um, you know, and we'll talk more about her and how we met and everything. That's uh, our son, Prithvi. He's six, uh, and he goes to uh, kindergarten. And our two daughters, who are twins, and and uh, they're going to turn three this April. So. Uh, we'll, Prakriti and Pranati. So um, 
you know, Ram uh, introduced me as the, as the hottest commodity. It made me feel like Rajnikanth, whose movie just came out. <laughs> and by the way, that, that has its pros and cons, by the way. Um, and uh, the pros and cons, uh, as you know, in, in the world of glitterati and media and the hype and everything else, that what goes up has to come down someday. So, uh, you know, as, a, as an individual, as an entrepreneur, and Preeti is here. She's one of my colleagues from Nutanix. Um, you know, we are constantly thinking about, uh, and I, I talk about this all the time, that, you know, I, we'd love to be remembered, not just the company, myself, everybody uh, that works in the company, not just for the fireworks in the night sky, which is what the IPO was, but for the, you know, um, the ledger of day-to-day -day work. You know, there's a lot of work that has gone in that, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, people have actually spent uh, you know, tons of uh, sleepless nights on. And uh, as a company, we'll go through our highs and lows, and hopefully we'll not just look at the IPO as, as the end, which, you know, is not a grand finale in any way. It's just a milestone in the journey. And uh, the company will be tested. And uh, I'll come back to you when we're going through our lows, and we'll see if I'm still invited to talk as well. So, uh, so that being said, um, you know, it's, it's a great place to be. Thank you so much for being here. I think the most constrained resource, the most precious resource we all have is our personal time. So the fact that you are really coming to listen and, and ask questions and interact uh, you know, is very overwhelming and at the same time very humbling as well. Um, I, was, uh, I was at another such event like two weeks ago. It was uh, it's called YJP. I don't know if some of you are familiar with YJP or not, but it's the Young Jewish Professionals Network in New York. And... Um, I was talking to my CFO the other day, and he's like, where were you? I'm like, oh, I was at YJP. He's like, YJP? What were you doing at YJP? I'm like, uh, well, Trump's here now, and, and I don't know what's going to do with uh, <laughs> you know, Indian Americans, so I'm hedging my bets, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think you know, obviously we're living in a very interesting world, and we are, we are all guessing as to what happens to immigrants. and. And this is a country that has given us so much, and we've all, most of us, everybody here uh, actually has gained so much from uh, the, the giving attitude of this country, the ac acceptance, the embrace of you know, the aliens, the foreigners who've come here and made this their home. So I'm looking forward to the fact that there'll be sanity and we'll actually embrace uh, uh, you know, folks who are you know, well wishing and would like to come and really build companies like the way we did. And not just that, but go and serve and, and build this economy as well. So um, the question is, uh, what would you like to hear? So I'm going to leave a lot of time for Q&A. Let me just set some context of, uh, of uh, just my life now. I'm 41. I was born in 1975. Uh, and I'm not going to be you know, wary of uh, giving you a birthday. It's 25th of August. So, you know. Uh, and in fact, recently I found another person who's a really good friend of mine now. His name is Deepak Malhotra, and he was born in the exact day, exact month, exact year, in 1975 as well. So I'm like, wow, you get to know, I, I get to know someone who I relate to so much who's born on the same day. And I was born in a, in a district called Hazaribagh, which is in uh, erstwhile Bihar. And, uh, and then uh, and at, when I was three or four, we moved to the capital city of Bihar, which is Patna. And uh, I was schooled in Patna, uh, which is uh, till, uh, till I was 17 or 18, I was in Patna. And uh, then um, I went to Kanpur, I to Kanpur for four years. And then at 22, I came to this country. So in 1997, I came here. So I made a kind of a really short version of those 22 years. But uh, if you were to dig a little deeper about uh, those 22 years, uh, what are the things I remember? I'll tell you about that because I don't want to bore you with everything about my life. But uh, when I was three or four, uh, I had a nickname. And it's relevant to what I finally became. But at three or four, one of my cousins, uh, who was someone that I um, relate to and learn from as well, he, he, called, he gave me a nickname called Atal. And uh, for those of you who uh, are not from North India, Atal means... Uh, resolute and maybe even borderline stubborn. So, you know, you can think of it that way. Um, and uh, it, it probably was 
something in me that he saw, and then a couple of my other big cousins, they were all like 20 years elder to me, so they did see something in me to call me Atal. And in fact, they still call me Atal till now, even though my uh, nickname is not uh, Atal for most of the people. Um, my father uh, is a retired doctor. You know, he um, uh, basically was working for the Bihar government, which, as you know, is a dysfunctional uh, government for a long, long time when we were growing up. And my mom, eventually, when uh, I was probably 15 or so, took up a job. She was a, she was a school teacher um, for about 10 years, and then she retired as well. I have a sibling who is... Uh, a year and a half elder to me. He also lives here in the Silicon Valley. Uh, he, he lives in uh, San Ramon. Uh, and uh, we grew up together, just like uh, buddies and twins, uh, just like twins, 18 months elder to me. Um, and then um, uh, the other things about my early life in Patna was that uh, we got a lot of help. We got a lot of help from our relatives because, um, you know, even though my father was a doctor, he uh, it's not like he had a private practice of his own because he was a psychiatrist, and it's not in India you see the idea of being depressed or mentally ill and all that stuff is considered a stigma, it's a social stigma to actually go to a mental doctor, and for some reason he chose that field. And uh, there was not enough money to be made on the side, so he was basically working for the government, and that was the only source of income. And um, Bihar, that was going through massive transformation to the negative side, because obviously there was a lot of political consciousness in the state till 1977, and then the state basically got politicized and criminalized and so on. So we all remember the Bihar after 1977, uh, when the Congress government was overthrown. And ever since, I think it was in this decrepit state, like completely decadent state, where there's nothing used to work. And we all laugh at the Bihar of the 90s, but there was a lot of turmoil in the state when we were growing up. In fact, it came out to become the most lawless state and probably the poorest state of India. And uh, probably even worse than some of the sub-Saharan countries as well. So I think uh, the government, as you can imagine, was not a functioning government. Uh, and therefore, he didn't get his salaries on time and all that stuff. So we got a lot of help from our relatives uh, and from the extended family and so on. So that's why... Uh, when I see, uh, you know, what I need to do now and give back, not just to my extended family and others, I'm like, look, I've come here, and we'll talk about some of the other giving, but I think I, I, I can remember a lot of how we grew up in, an, in a relatively large joint family and extended family, and there's a lot of help coming to us, which is very selfless. There was no quid pro quo attached to that. So I remember that about my first uh, 17 years. And then uh, when I was 16... This was a fork in the road for me again. Uh, so I got into IIT in 92, and uh, I, I didn't get a good rank. I mean, for those of you who don't probably, I don't know if you've heard of uh, the IIT system, but there's an All India exam. It's called the Joint Entrance Exam. And I got a rank of 1,420. And uh, I really wanted to get into IIT Kanpur, which was kind of the premier campus at that time. It's changed a lot these days, which I bemoan, but uh, because of its location, it doesn't look as good as it was back then. Uh, so uh, I really wanted to get to Kanpur, and I got to Kanpur, but I got a branch, uh, a department, which was not computer science. I got uh, into civil engineering. So I went to Kanpur in August, and then within two months, I realized I really got to do computer science. You know, There's no way I can do computer science. And uh, I got utter, I got stubborn a little, and I started to talk about in October of uh, 92 that I need to really figure out how to get into computer science. And uh, I started talking to my, to my mom about this first, and she's like, uh, but what do you want to do about this? I'm like, you know, I'm still thinking. I could get a, a brand change, as we used to call it, or a department change after, at the end of first year. I could move to a different major, but the probabilities are one in 10,000, because only one person gets it, and there's all these uh, probabilities you need to apply on that. So out of 300, a batch of 300, only one person gets to computer science at the end of the first year. So uh, what was the other choice I had? I said, you know what, I, I need to focus and probably look at another option, and that option could be quit here and go back and take the exam one more time, and the probabilities are better. And uh, that's the decision I eventually took, and everybody in the ecosystem was, including my family, except for one person, my mom, everybody else said, you're crazy. 
you are leaving something that you have in hand and you're going for two in the bush. And I said, I'll take my chances, I'll roll the dice. Because uh, at the end of the day, given what's happening in India, and you know, software is the big thing, and there's a lot of stuff that's going on that will relate back to software and, and things like that, I need to really go back and, and test myself as to how good I am before I um, you know, find other ways to get to software itself. So I quit, and it was not an easy decision for most people around me. It was relatively easy for me. My mom said, you know what, I think I trust in what you're doing. I'm pretty sure next year you'll come out some. And, and the worst case was not bad enough. That's the way I was thinking about it. And I'll tell you why this term means a lot to me. The worst is not bad enough. It's a very reassuring thing in life, by the way. Like, really, really reassuring. Because if you can say that honestly and with all the authenticity, then nothing is as risky as you think. Because the risk actually considers the worst case. And it says it's not bad enough. So you're not really being irrational. The, the most irrational decisions, if they're actually netted by the worst case planning, you know, and you're, if you have reconciled yourself for the worst case, you probably will take that big risk. So I took the risk. I went back home, and, and there were a lot of eyes. They're like, well, the guy he was there in Kanpur, and what happened is return in October after two months. And uh, I prepared for the exam one more time. Again, you felt like you were underprepared. Uh, but this time around, it was, I was lucky. I got a rank of 84. And uh, if you're in top 100 of the country, and this is actually a relatively uh, difficult exam. There's 200,000 people who take the exam, and only 2,000 get in, and only the top 100 actually get into computer science. So I was, I'm sure there was a lot of luck in there as well. But this time, I, I actually came to IIT Kanpur, and you know, I was in computer science. But again, the, the act of getting in is no different than an IPO of a company, by the way. It's the exact same thing. You're now in the first among equals. You know? And you know, Nirav Doctor, who's sitting somewhere here, is one of my um, batchmates from Kanpur, would tell you. And a lot of you other folks who've actually been to IITs will tell you that it's a great leveler. You know, this thing is a great leveler because you're probably at the top of your school. You're the king of the hill at wherever you are, and, and even not just IIT, but a lot of the other engineering schools in India are like that, where uh, you were at the top of the, uh, wherever you are, and now you come in and you're basically a first among equals. You know, there's no such thing as somebody better than you until you go and really prove. And I feel that today, by the way. As, as a CEO of a public company, I'm like basically back to ground zero. You know, this is... Uh, starting the company one more time, go prove every quarter, just like you proved every semester back then as well. And uh, because you know, a lot of people give up, you know, when the system is so tough, I mean, probably the toughest moments of my life were to really manage myself, my personal life, my extracurricular activities, uh, along with academics, which is basically a, a pressure cooker environment. And, you know, uh, the IITs back then, and even I'm sure now, there's so much focus on academics and you know, what do you really end up doing in terms of scores. So fortunately, I did a good job. You know, first four semesters, I was actually a straight 10. And you know, it actually helped uh, in at least uh, taking the third year as a way to plan. And I said, what do I really want to do? Uh, I, I wasn't sure what I really wanted to do. Um, I had done a relatively OK job of extracurriculars. We got a lot of speakers in. I was actually big into learning from people who would come and speak about good things. And I do a lot of that today as well with advisors. And a lot of our speaking sessions, and probably um, Preeti can actually attest to some of that. So we get a ton of really good people to come and talk to our, our employees today as well. But what I find a lot of strength in is when, because you get a few things from them, and it's a gem, actually. So we, uh, I used to get a lot of those people at IIT Kanpur. By the end of the third year, uh, you know, I had a decent you know, score in, in my academics, and um, I was enjoying life. Uh, I, uh, I'm like, like, what do I do now? I said, you know, I'll take, my, I'll take a hedge. I'll at least apply to the universities. So in the summer of 96, uh, I started applying to schools. Uh, and uh, um, I also had a job from uh, Unilever India. You know, this is a general management trainee job, and you'd end up becoming a 
GM of something someday if you actually do well, otherwise you'd quit after a while. But Unilever India was a very prestigious job back in the day, actually. And I said, uh, maybe I could get into general management. And they're like, well, I did computer science. For what? I mean, I quit my first uh, stint at IIT, and I did computer science. But I was looking at myself as a generalist by this time, and I said I could do something like that. And then uh, I was crazy enough sometimes to talk to my cousin here, say, maybe I want to do a PhD in economics. And he's like, are you crazy? You have the best degree that the world could ask for, and you're going to throw all that away and do a PhD in economics? Because back in the day, Manmohan Singh was hot. You know, you basically look at, like, wow, I just want to be that guy. He's the prime minister of the country. He has reformed India. You know, he has done so much to get it out of uh, its rut. And it's all driven by economics. So, you know, there was, there was so much focus on economics in India back in back in 95, 96, because the country had just opened up. It was a socialist country till for like 40, 50 years, probably, yeah, 50 years, and, and they were just opening up to embrace capitalism for the first time, and this, just the idea of learning economics to go and change the country was very fascinating. But I think my cousin actually poured some uh, cold water on that thing. I said, no, 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 you've got a really good background, a foundation, Go figure out what it means to work in software, and, and if you can get into the universities, you know, well and good. So uh, I applied and I got to some good schools. I mean, I probably hadn't prepared well for GRE, so you know, I didn't apply to Stanford back then, but applied to some good schools in CS, top 10 schools in uh, graduate program in CS, and I got through University of Texas, Austin, um, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Columbia, you know, Northwestern, places like that. And uh, again, there was a fork in the road, like, well, what do I do? Do I go to Austin or do I go to uh, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign? And I finally, the decision became easy because one of my mentors at the time, his name, um, and I'm sure some of you re recognize him, is uh, Gokul Rajaram. And he was also an IT Kanpur grad, and he also had the same fork in the road. He's like, look, just go to Austin. It's warm and you know, happy cows. You've never seen snow before. You know, you actually <laughs> just want to end up uh, at a warmer place as opposed to going and really being in the, in the snow of uh, Illinois. So, uh, and it was also easy because I, I had a fellowship from the department and I didn't have to pick an advisor uh, in the first 18 months. So I, I uh, so the real, again, the second act of giving uh, is what I remember now. I talk to everybody, I even talk to our son and tell him about how scarcity is so good and how you need to actually embrace less because he has too many toys. I'm like, you don't need those many toys. Fewer toys is a better thing. But I remember uh, distinctly, very vividly, that uh, we didn't have money to come to, to fly to the US. Yes, the university will take care of my stay here and give me a stipend, pay my tuition and everything else, and that's a scholarship. But that doesn't mean that they'll actually give me a couple of thousand dollars to buy a ticket and at least have something in my pocket to, for the first month before my st stipend arrives. So I didn't know exactly what to do, and obviously it was a lot of money, actually. It was like probably needed 50,000 rupees, which is um, at least uh, $1,000, $1,200 for buying a ticket to, to the US. So I found a couple of good uh, trusts, education trusts from these big conglomerates, you know, one of them was Tata, you know, they had a Jane Tata Endowment Fund, and then there was a KC Mahindra Education Trust. These were two large conglomerates in India who were funding, you know, students going abroad. Um, and I didn't need the money for anything after I landed here, but I still needed some money to be able to get here. And uh, I ended up getting $3,000. I left 1000 with my parents. That was kind of my first give back to them for all, all of the good stuff they had done uh, to actually really raise us. I mean, life, it was not that easy. I mean, just going back to the days of uh, my high school, middle school, and so on, my mom had to sell a, a lot of personal jewelry that she had gotten as part of the marriage to fund a lot of her education because Patna was still an expensive city compared to the tier two, tier three towns that we could have lived in. But uh, my mom was adamant that we could not sacrifice an education. You know, there has to be English medium school, and you had to take the best of the best kind of uh, education so that uh, we don't face the same problems that uh, my parents had actually faced. 
So, um, you know, I look, I, I said, you know, the first give back I can give is right now. I can buy a ticket for $1,000. I can leave 1000 with them. And then uh, I came to the US with, uh, just like a lot of you, with like $900 in my pocket and two suitcases. And uh, I'd never taken a flight before in life. So everybody uh, in Delhi, I took a train to come to Delhi, is giving me all sorts of tips about how do you really sit in a flight, how do you use the safety belt, and, and what do you not do, and stuff like that. And I'm like, don't make me nervous. You know, it's not going to be that big a deal, actually. You know? And it ended up not being a big deal. Now, it took me like three hops to get here. You know, there was, uh, I mean, I was kind of deboarded from an Air India flight because they were overbooked, so I got into a United flight that took me from Delhi to London, London to JFK, and from JFK I took a TWA, I still remember it was TWA back then, you know, uh, from, uh, from um, uh, JFK to Austin. And now I have like, this really grandiose view of what the US looks like. And I then all of a sudden start to land, I'm like, where are the big buildings in Austin, Texas? You know, this was uh, a college town. Back in the day, 97, Austin was a happening place in a small little way because it was a, it was a music capital of Texas and it was a great university, but uh, there was nothing like what you would expect from Manhattan or I mean, not even close. But anyway, I land, I'm like, I hope uh, this is the place to be. It's happening enough for me to actually go and uh, lay the foundation of, uh, of a US stay. Uh, and in fact, a couple of folks showed up. They actually, you know, I, I stayed at some stranger student's place for like 20 days before I could even find an apartment of my own and so on. So some, you know, really good people who helped me again one more time. And uh, in the, now what happens is gets, it gets interesting from there because this is like uh, two months again, October of, uh, looks, looks like things happen to me in October, which are quite seminal. In October of 97, I was two months in this country and you know, I was feeling a little homesick. And, I, uh, and I'm a fellow, so I don't have to really do a TA ship. You know, I'm like, yeah, I can find my advisor over time. I, I actually end up going to a website. Uh, and internet was not a luxury in the US. It was actually, you know, in, especially in the universities, you don't have to pay for dial-up. You get to a lab and you, know, you can actually access the internet. And uh, there was no messenger or any, kind, any of those tools to actually talk to anybody. So I get to this website called talkcity.com. You know, it was a place where you could actually go and chat. And I, I'm like, okay, what room do I, I mean, everybody is talking about Talk City, so I go to Talk City, and I find a room called Bombay. And uh, I'm like, you know, Bombay sounds familiar. You know, I'm a little homesick, probably I'll uh, meet some people that can talk about Bollywood movies or music or some such thing. And uh, I land in Bombay, and then uh, very quickly I meet somebody who is uh, with a nickname, uh, and, uh, and uh, I start talking to her, and it's, it's a girl, and she was uh, somewhere on the other side of the world. I mean, I don't even know where she was, and we start talking, and we talk, talk for like nine hours. And I could remember that those nine hours, you know, that the room dwindled from like 50 people down to just the two of us, actually. And this is like 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. I finish my chat for the first time. And, uh, you know, uh, then I started calling her like two, three weeks later, and I'm like, you know, where are you? And she said, you know, I'm, I'm actually vacationing in the Middle East. My parents uh, have been working here since uh, 1977. And uh, I, you know, I go to, uh, I go to college in, in Bangalore. Uh, I'm doing a bachelor's in business administration. And, and we get to know each other on the phone and we start talking. And all, along the way, obviously, our parents are basically saying, you know what, don't even, think of talking to strangers like that. This is a, a dangerous world and you know, who knows who's on the other side and so on. So she's getting a lot of uh, sort of pushback from parents like, you know, be really careful. You know, it's like, what are you really doing? So, uh, but we, we still go ahead and, and do something uh, clandestine and stuff, but start talking on the phone and, and all that stuff happens and it happens for like 10 months. And now I'm like, I really need to see her because I've never seen her before. I've never met her before. So uh, I, I'm like, okay, well, how do I do this? Uh, all I have is 10 days because I, I was interning at Oracle back in 98 here in, the, in Redwood Shores, uh, which is where I really got to see what Silicon Valley was all about. And I'm like, uh, at Oracle, I kind of hustle to find those 10 days because typically you don't find 10 days after internship before the school starts again. So I hustled with my managers. I need 10 days to go to India. 
And uh, then I'm like, what do I tell my mom and my dad that I'm coming to meet a girl that I have known for 10 months? And, and uh, I'm trying to, like, I mean, it's extremely bizarre and kind of weird to actually go and do that. So I take a really, uh, I mean, when I look back at it, I'm like, I don't know why I did it. But I went to India for the first time. And this is obviously a very, um, I would say, um, you know, touching thing for Indian parents. But I went to India, but I just went to meet with Sapna, who's sitting right here, and uh, in Hyderabad, actually, of all places. And I said, I'm going to maximize these 10 days, really get to know her and understand if she's, uh, you know, the, the one and, and if she thinks I'm the one. And her parents are, like, watching all this stuff. Like, you know, this is extremely weird. You know, there's no such thing uh, that we believe in where you know, strangers can come in and just get to know each other over 10 months. Obviously, some of this thunk, I mean, along the way on those 10 months, you know, they had kind of in proxy gotten to know me through all the phone calls and such. Uh, so I, I meet with her. I spend, like, 10 days with her. Obviously, there's a lot of security around her about, you know, <laughs> Indian parents being Indian parents, like, nah, yeah, you get this time, two hours here, four hours there, and so on. Um, and, um, and I don't go home, actually, you know, I, because I knew that there would be nothing I can tell my wife if this is really something embarrassing, you know? So I don't go home. And I remember when I was, turning, when I was coming back, uh, she and I were, like, crying like anything. I'm like, wow, I'm, like, you know, I'm 22, and I'm doing this stuff emotionally. I was 23 back then, actually, uh, in 98. And uh, you know, then we were long distance dating for another two and a half years, and finally, we decided to tie the knots in December of 2000. And uh, so that's been another journey after that. You know, in 2000, uh, so at UT, I said, you know, I'm going to go on a leave of absence. I know I'm a PhD student, uh, but I saw the valley and I felt like, wow, this is the place to be, and uh, I probably need to actually go and be, and at least partake in this big thing that's happening, which was the internet bubble. So the internet bubble had really messed up with me, and I said, this is the time to be in the industry and not be um, at, at a school pursuing my PhD. So I took a leave of absence, and the school was very patient. They're like, look, uh, looks like you want to go and try something. We'll you know, let you tinker. But I think by the end of two years, they sent me a letter saying, you've got to reapply now. You know, it can't be going on forever. So basically, I worked at Austin in Austin for a year, um, and then I came to the Valley in, in 2000. I actually literally drove from Texas to California. I said, I'll pack everything in like a few boxes. And I drove from, from uh, Texas to California. And I started working um, before, just before a marriage, started working at a startup which was building uh, clustered file servers. These are like you know, distributed systems. It's computer science. It's hardcore systems building. And I said I could use some of my skills building some of these uh, systems to will compete with large companies. Back in the day, the competition or the bar was NetApp, you know, a company that was doing pretty well and had crossed the billion-dollar barrier and was getting big into the enterprise with their ease of use story and their data management capabilities and so on. And there was tons of good lessons to learn in those two and a half, three years that I was there at this startup for of what not to do, actually. You know, that was probably the biggest thing that I uh, really learned is not what to do, but what not to do. But again, everybody here who was there, who was living the bubble, probably knows of uh, the hype, the hysteria, uh, the irrationality of a different kind, actually, that happened um, in that time. But uh, extremely top-down, top-down in the sense of spending a ton of money building you know, vice presidents before you could build a you know, the grassroots and building a product first and so on. So, I mean, we kind of frittered away $65 million, and, which is no big deal because the companies are spending billions of dollars for nothing. So we spent $65 million over three, four years, and not much came out of it. Obviously, the lessons were great, but, and the people that we had hired were really, really good people, and a lot of them have gone on to do really good things in the Valley. So that was probably the biggest uh, takeaway from that company. Uh, lots of founders who made like billion dollar companies uh, ever since. Um, so after three years when the thing shut down, I went to Oracle for about four and a half years and uh, learned to build databases, you know, like distributed databases, you know, clusters, and even doing more hardcore systems building and software. And uh, I became a manager of people and I started to lead some projects very quickly. But I, was, I had the itch, I'm like, you know, I need to really go do something from now because the economy was recovering, 
you know, obviously, O2 wasn't passed. There was this hysteria about, well, things are again frothing up. And I'm like, now's the time to actually go roll the dice one more time. And uh, in 06, uh, I'm like, what do I do to really step out of Oracle and do something different? So um, I, was, uh, I was talking to my wife, and you know, we were basically discussing a few things. And uh, it's not like we had a lot of savings. I mean, basically, we were just you know, uh, people with no kids, and we were spending a ton. We were traveling around the country and stuff like that. But uh, I said, you know, maybe I should actually just roll the dice one more time on a full-time MBA. You know, that probably will help me get to folks uh, who are like-minded and will actually build a company with me, build a startup. Because I always had this thing about building a company because I'd seen my cousin, he, you know, this cousin of mine that I keep talking about had built a really good company which has gone through his lows and highs. Uh, the name of the company was Nextag, N-E-X-T-A-G. Uh, he was, uh, Kanwal was actually uh, one of the uh, investors in that. See, I think Kanwal has built some awesome companies, and one of them was Nextag. So Nextag, for those of you who don't know, is a comparison shopping engine. And now maybe Kanwal will uh, not like me as much because my cousin was hard to deal with. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, uh, but he, I mean, in terms of conviction and the fire in the belly, there's a lot of lessons to learn from him. So Nextag, he was the founder and CEO, and he sold it for about, you know, 1.3 billion, and he, I mean, it was 800 uh, into a private equity, and then they were supposed to earn out another half a billion over time. Um, so I had seen some of that entrepreneurship in him, and I said, I need to probably, you know, you know, get close, if not better. And you know, he was kind of the bar. And uh, so anyway, so I was, uh, I was, uh, I was thinking about how to roll the dice one more time, and I said, you know, I think the the opportunity cost of Anything but Stanford, Howard Wharton is probably not as big. You know, I'm already doing a good enough job. So let me just apply to these three schools. And the real question is what? Like an exec program or a full-time program? And I said, uh, and I told my wife, we, she's like, you know what? Maybe if you're really passionate, we can, and if you want to go for a full-time, go for a full-time uh, program, actually. You know? And that would mean hardship for the family because, you know, we are, married together for a while, we'd have to really sh shrink everything in terms of footprint, go to a college, save as much as we could, and obviously there was no income, so all that stuff is lost. But she was ready for it, so like, yeah, if you, I mean, just like my mom in the early days, like, yeah, if you want to quit IIT, come back, and she was like, yeah, if you, I'd, I'd actually be happy to actually go and really shrink our lives for two years, and hopefully good things will come out. So I just applied to three schools, Stanford and Howard Wharton, I'm 31, and uh, you know, definitely I was not differentiated enough. I was an Indian engineer. They have to figure out the diversity things. Like, <laughs> okay, we can't have too many Indian engineers in the business program, right? You need to have some, but not a lot. So April of seven comes, and April of seven arrives, and I start to see the big shocks in the system, and how do I really absorb them? Stanford says no, Harvard says no, and I was just waiting for what, and I'm like, okay, I hope this one actually comes. And Wharton says no in April. I'm like, I'm crushed. I mean, the thing that I really wanted to do, and I thought I was smart to actually get into these schools, didn't happen. So my wife and I, uh, she's like, okay, you know what, don't worry, we'll have find other ways to really um, you know, have you get to what you want to do. Obviously, it looked like the end of the world, you know. So what do we do? We said, you know what, my, one of my best friends, Ajit Singh, uh, who now runs ThoughtSpot, he was in Phoenix, he was working for, uh, he used to, who came from Honeywell, India to come and work there for about a year or two. So let's just drive, you know, we'll just drive and we'll forget all this stuff. So I took a week off and two of us, we just started at 3 a.m. in the morning. He said, we'll just nonstop drive to Phoenix and hopefully we'll live some good days there. I'll come back and I'll figure out what we need to do next from there, right? So we just had an awesome time in Phoenix. You know, I go there and you know, visit his place, you know, uh, Ajit's wife and uh, Sapna are great friends, and so, so are Ajit and I. But yeah, I mean, that, those seven days were awesome to just absorb the shock of this adversity that, you know, I just can't do what I wanted to do. But the itch is still there. I'm like, you know, obviously I have to keep moving forward. There's no end to this world simply because I'm not worthy of Stanford, Howard, and Wharton, right? 
so yet this, I mean, I mean, I was a passionate uh, professional, so I would work really hard at Oracle, and my wife would like, it's a big company, do you really want to do that much? I'm like, look, there's only 10% of the people in large companies who do well, and the company takes care of them. So I was you know, being taken care of. Um, but then uh, a cold call comes. You know, and this is like out of nowhere. Like there's some recruiter who calls me and like, look, there's a startup that's really looking for a great engineering leader to build their um, systems and, and this is their engineering team and so on. And this company is Sequoia funded and you know, you like this, you know, this is a place for you to spread your wings and learn more things and so on. So uh, I ended up talking to them, and it's a really small 10-people company, uh, Stanford guys, you know, two years uh, coming out of Stanford. They'd built something at Stanford. And they're building a, a distributed data warehouse. So it's like a database software running on commodity servers. And uh, I get intrigued. I'm like, look, uh, I probably want to go and do this. Um, and I start to convince my wife that it's time to go back to something smaller with a, with a you know, really large pay cut as well. And uh, the real, I mean, again, one of those things that uh, was not hard for me, but could be hard for a lot of you that I would like to actually just at least talk about is uh, there was a bird in hand. And the bird in hand had become really big because the counter offer that Oracle gives to, uh, you know, people who they actually want to retain. And the counter offer was massive. I didn't think they valued me as much as that one day when I talked to like, there's no way we can let you go. He's like 300,000 shares, and those shares are worth like four or five million dollars in the next four or five years. Uh, the shares were valued 17 bucks and over the next four years were something. And they're like, here is another 100K, whatever. So it's a massive pay raise and all that stuff. And uh, you know, all I told myself is the worst is not bad enough. You know, I think I can always find a job again in the valley. This is the valley. This is the place to roll the dice one more time. And, um, and worst case, I can always walk back into Oracle one more time anyway. So I, I took that uh, sort of uh, faith and went to this company, Astra Data, and the company's name was Astra Data, and um, found a couple of these founders really entrepreneurial, and I said, I could learn from them. You know? I could learn a lot of what, because they had rolled the dice a lot sooner than I had. I mean, this was 2007, I was uh, 32, and these guys were like 25, 26, 27 kind of stuff, you know? I said, I could learn from these guys on what it means to take, take uh, risks. And, uh, I ended up going there, I learned a lot, you know, I started to, I became the VP of engineering relatively quickly and we built a team, the company went up to, she's already telling me it's time, you know. <laughs> but uh, I spent uh, some good years, two years there, and uh, again I learned a lot of what it means to build a company. The company was about 120, 130 people, uh, and uh, there, was, there was some shifts happening when we were building this company. Basically we had built a, a killer of hardware systems, like Teradata systems and Netezia systems. These were massive, big honking machines that were doing data warehousing and analytics, and Google had a ton of Netezia, and you know, a lot of companies are buying Teradata and Oracle databases to really do this analytics that was coming from the internet companies and so on. So it was a great niche in the sense of internet companies doing analytics for the first time. And uh, this company had some one or two large customers, like MySpace was one of them. And uh, again, there were some great lessons, and if you have questions later on about what those are, I can actually get into them. But the one thing that I didn't get, uh, along with the two of my peers who I knew from the past, Ajit being one of them, who I had also convinced to come and join from Oracle. Uh, I first convinced him to go from Honeywell to Oracle and then from Oracle to Aster. But before he joined, I had left uh, for Aster. So the three of us were there at Aster, and we just felt like uh, we couldn't spread our wings. Uh, we couldn't actually, and the founders are not willing to let go of the strategy of where the company should be headed, because NoSQL, which was the Hadoop uh, sort of uh, phenomenon, is upon the internet companies. And the one niche that we were good at was now saying, we can build this. We can build with open source. You know, Yahoo is feeding this, and Facebook is feeding it. So at the end of the day, the cusp in the road was, you know, do you really become a niche SQL database that would compete with Oracle and Netezia and Teradata, or do you embrace this Hadoop thing and try to figure out what it means to build a hybrid database with both NoSQL and SQL? And they're just not willing to actually change the strategy from 05, which is where the genesis of the company was. So we decided to quit. Uh, the three of us decided to quit. We kind of were talking for six months about you know, we need to move on. 
And uh, two of us, uh, Mohit and I, actually quit first in September of 2009. Uh, on you know, 22nd September, we incorporated the company. We, we actually sponsored Ajit's H-1B visa because he's still a non-immigrant uh, employee. And then it took about a couple of months for him to get his uh, visa. In November, he had his visa. The three of us were now a company. Uh, by December, we got our first uh, kind of seed money that came from Bipul Sinha, who, is, uh, uh, who was at Lightspeed and now doing his own company called Rubric. Uh, Bipul and I were great friends from Oracle. Um, you know, we had worked together four years. We had exchanged notes in our own lives and where we want to be and so on. So we'd really become really close at Oracle. So he was now in a VC firm and said, look, my first bet is going to be Dheeraj. And that's what he did. He made a bet on Nutanix with a deck of slides. I mean, we didn't have anything. And uh, by... Uh, by March, April, Lightspeed was warming up. They're like, look, there's a team of people who have left Astrodata, which was a good Sequoia-funded company, so they must have some good talent. And uh, by April, May, Bipul had joined Lightspeed from that old firm of his. And by July, we had done our Series A, which was uh, another $13 million. So we had raised about $13 million in six months. And uh, the idea was to go and do a Hadoop for everybody. So that was kind of the strategy. Like, if Hadoop is good for big data, why isn't a Hadoop-like architecture good for everybody, every application, and probably all the legacy applications in the last 20 years as well? And so that's what, that was the thesis. You know, learn from these big data use cases, what Google is doing, what Facebook is doing, what Amazon is doing. All these web properties have a new architecture that's based on commoditizing the hardware, because the hardware is not important anymore. It's, uh, the value is now in the software. And the uh, differentiation is in software. So figure out what it means to take all these boxes that are actually exist in the data center and uh, make them into pure software. So the question then comes, like, what's the first thing you want to actually go after? Because you need to pick one uh, sort of uh, industry, one vertical, one appliance, one application to go after. And he said, look, we're good at managing data. So why don't we go after storage companies? And we'll basically take... Uh, this $25 billion of storage hardware economics, and we'll kind of fold it into pure software and make it look like it's a web-scale architecture running in commodity servers, you know, Taiwan white boxes, and then the value will actually come into pure software running on these commodity servers. So we ended up picking uh, storage as a first sort of thing to virtualize, and uh, it actually was a pretty good showing. Now, there were some really critical decisions we had to make about how do we really differentiate? Because obviously we don't want to be yet another EMC, yet another NetApp. So we had to be something different. And what we realized is that we can't be them. So let's not be them, because if you try to build a cheaper, faster them, the incumbency has other ways of pricing you out and competing with you. So what does it mean to change the turf? And that realization came early on, said, look, we can't, cannot and should not be them. But can we fold them in? Can we make them invisible? Can we make them transparent? Where we change the consumption model of them. You know, in some sense, that's what Amazon is doing too. They're like, look, we just have to change the consumption model on them as opposed to trying to be more of them. So we change the consumption model of storage. No different than the way uh, you think about the iPhone and the camera app is a different consumption model of the same thing you can buy from Costco for 1000 bucks, right? So just like photography, the consumption model change became a pure software. We had to go and change the consumption model of this thing, and hopefully we'll have a chance. So that's what we ended up doing. You know, I think the key design challenge for us was to make sure that everything remains the same above us, but everything changes below us. That was kind of the big design constraint, because if we had to go after a lot of the legacy applications, which had been built for the last 20 years, we had to provide this facade. We had to fool everybody above us that nothing has changed. Don't worry about it. While well, everything underneath has actually changed. So that design challenge, the fact that we were being disruptive below us but not being disruptive above us was a very important sort of constraint that we had to work with. And uh, then also uh, Apple was happening. iOS was happening in, uh, by 0910. Like we have to change one more thing, which is, the way you consume it is not by consulting and professional services and, and a ton of people, but this design thinking of what would Apple do. So some big lessons, or at least some dreams that we had is, if Apple could do this to the consumer, then why can't we do this to the enterprise? So we became a really design-focused company. 
uh, in those uh, very early years, you know, seeded uh, a lot of thinking about think about user experience and ease of use and simplicity and things like that. So um, you know, obviously, you know, the first three four years were always a challenge, and we can get into some of the details as well. Um, but the one thing that happened, uh, which is very sort of timely with we conceiving the company, is uh, again another kind of uh, thing that we had to do. I called my cousin and said, "Hey, what do you think? I'm going to start a company. I'm going to quit everything." And my wife and I think that uh, we should postpone family. We should not have our first kid yet. And um, and he gave me a really good advice. He actually said, "Look, you're 34." Uh, and he was like, at that time, probably 45 or 47 or something. He was like, don't do what I did. I postponed everything. And he, in fact, never got married, actually. And he's like, if you become a father, you probably will be a much better entrepreneur than who I was and what I was and so on. Because you learn to be patient, you learn to listen, you learn to do a lot of those things. So just do everything. And if, if, if it's supposed to happen, everything will come together. You don't have to really look at this as a zero-sum game. And, and uh, in January of 10, we conceived our first son, which is Prithvi right here. And uh, in October, he was born. And definitely, it was not easy to actually do a company and, and actually have a young family. So my wife really said, you know what, I'm going to quit my job. And you know, a lot of what we are today as a company and as a professional and as a family, a lot of it is owed back to what she has done as a life partner. And been very understanding. I mean, I, two days ago, I came back uh, with so much of stress and everything else, and I could just see the kind of patience that she has with me with when I have three kids now, actually, you know, it's just amazing. So when people say that, you know, there's a, there's a woman behind uh, any kind of success in a man's life, it's true, actually. And I, and I tell her all this time that there's a reason why the California law says 50-50. And it's, 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 it's the truth behind it. Because most entrepreneurship is a 50-50 partnership, you know, if not more, actually, you know, for a lopsided towards uh, the other spouse who's actually taking a big sacrifice in life to say, look, I'm going to curb my ambition. I'm going to do what's right for this. Because eventually, you know, we have two ventures going on. There's a venture that you're doing, and there's a venture that we have at home. So. I, I couldn't be here without what she had actually done for, for our family as well. And uh, you know, we didn't have a lot. I mean, um, she was willing to actually you know, cut everything down and go to a, a full-time MBA program that, by the way, didn't happen. But she, we only had $100,000 in a bank in 2009. And I'm like, you know what, we'll roll the dice. Worst case, I can always go back to working for someone else. And she was okay with it, you know. She was, uh, even though we we're going to have a family and everything else, we said we'll figure it out, we'll get sorted out. So obviously there were some big risks, but again, being in the valley was, again, the worst case was not bad enough. Now, in retrospect, when I look back, I think that not going to the business school was probably the best thing to have happened to me. And I'll tell you why. It's because if I had graduated in 09, I'd probably be jobless. But think about it. 09 was the worst time to actually graduate from any school out there, right? So uh, at best, I would have ended up as a product manager or a McKinsey consultant or whatever. And then entrepreneurship would never have come to me this naturally, actually. You know? So you know, another thing that I keep telling myself now, I've become a, a huge fatalist, you know, just the fact that there's a reason for everything. And if it, it has happened, there's a reason why it's happened. You know? so, started to believe at the very core that fatalism is, is basically it. And it helps me absorb a lot more shocks. I mean, um, you know, my early childhood was not easy, actually. I mean, I've seen uh, some things that probably none of you ever would have imagined. But uh, those shocks have actually helped me, and including that 07 uh, shock, has helped me to become a more calm entrepreneur as well. So the idea of going to the highs and lows that's why I don't get elated at this idea of an IPO. You know, um, so yes, we went through the IPO last year. There was, it was not without its hiccups and, and uh, all sorts of media attention and such. But I know that this, this high that we're going through will actually turn into some lows along the way. And, and um, you know, the media and uh, the Wall Street, they're all extremely fickle about things. You know, they will take you through the lows, because there's only two things the mob knows. The mob knows, and I've learned this the hard way, the mob knows either to 
pelt stones, you know, basically a witch hunt, or the mob knows to uh, worship idols. And these are only two things the mob knows, actually. There's no third thing that it actually knows. So if you're a wannabe, which is what we are, we're a wannabe company right now, and um, you know, I'm unwilling to throw the towel and sell this company, right? So you can imagine, it's like, these are bold moves, like, why? Why would you just sell off? And I mean, my wife asked me, there's so much stress. You know, what are you doing this for? And I'm like, look, we're this close. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Cisco in 95 had an offer to, to sell itself. I'm pretty, and Google had an offer for three billion. They said five and we'll do it. And Yahoo said, walk away, you know, go away. Uh, and uh, all these companies had to basically curb that uh, you know, temptation to actually sell off. And hopefully, you know, if you have the ambition and the attention to detail, good things will happen. So I think the big thing for us is, you know, can we summon the staying power? And it's the word is staying power. You know, it's the operational word that we use in the company to really go through the highs and lows of what a public company is. And uh, I know it's going to be a, there's going to be a ton of challenges. We it's a, it's a great test bed for for our staying power for you know this Japanese word that I've come to embrace. The Japanese word is called gaman. So if you have Wikipedia right now, you look at the word gaman. Gaman is a really awesome word, by the way. And if you are an entrepreneur, if you're really trying to do things. Not just entrepreneur, but if you're in a marriage and you're in a relationship, you know what gaman means, actually. Gaman is about tenacity. It's about going through the penance. It's the hard work that you need to do. It's spelled as G-A-M-A-N. But, uh, you know, there's a gaman ahead of us. And um, I think, uh, and, and times have actually not been uh, all, I mean, if you look at the last seven years, it all looks like it's hunky-dory and so on. It's not like that at all. I mean, not just what Preeti sees on an everyday basis, but what we had to, I mean, we had near-death experiences in this company, too, that I can actually get a little more detail into. But we've had to go through a lot of that stuff. Uh, I mean, some, you know, things that happened along the way, big personal losses in, in, our, uh, in our lives as well. Um, you know, my uh, father-in-law was very close to me, and, and uh, he passed away last year in, in uh, August, and... And I feel really, uh, obviously, this is a huge personal loss. I mean, I'm sure my mom-in-law is getting equally emotional, but to, to go and actually bury somebody with that close and in a country that was, uh, that was extremely alien to us because this was an Arabic-speaking country in, in a country called Oman, and nobody speaks English, and you're at the mercy of some you know, people called PRO, public relations officer or something like that, to actually go and get that paperwork going to find the land, to actually go bury someone who's that uh, important in life. A lot of that stuff was hard, and this is just 20 days before the IPO. So imagine um, what all of us are going through. But uh, you know, that, that, uh, those shocks that uh, sort of, uh, and I'm getting a little emotional because of all this stuff, but it was really, uh, it, it builds you, it builds your character. So uh, I'm gonna stop here and see if there are any questions from people. Uh, rather than bore you on a lot of this stuff. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, oh, let me just say thank you very much for spending the time here and this evening, and thank you all for coming here. So we'll get started with the questions. We have a new way we are doing the questions this year. We have had people uh, you know, send the questions to uh, bit.ly, sign up that we had sent you a link. If you can do that, then we will display them up here on the board and then we'll go through them so that there's no repetition and questions. I hope that's okay. And if we run through them and we still have time, we'll take questions from the audience, right? So thanks, thanks, uh, Dheeraj. And uh, do you want to just go through the questions? Yeah, probably I'll pick one of them that's more on the personal side as opposed to talk about strategy, which okay. is something that we can always talk in emails. So idea into a company, what are the three definitions that you changed? Uh, so I talked about one of them, which is, uh, you know, don't try to be something else. But if you can try to change the turf a little bit, where you are talking on your own turf, things can be better. So in the last uh, four years, I think uh, things got a little testy with VMware. You know, that's one of the partners, partner companies. So we're running an operating system underneath us, and that was uh, VMware. And uh, we were running our software, there were two pieces, the data plane and the control plane on top of VMware. And obviously, uh, you know, these things happen in this industry, in the, in the IT ecosystem, it happens a lot, where 
a partner now becomes competitive, so they decided to get in our space. And uh, this is a, you know, January of 2014. Something happened which basically froze us. And they, they thought it's done. This company's done. We can kill them the way they are right now because it's becoming a sort of a, a pain in the neck in some sense as, as a partner company that's really going to try to compete with us. And um, what they did was very interesting. They said, look, uh, if, if we really have to get into this space, we have to make sure we take away something from them. And they took away something from us, which was the ability to ship their software, the free software that we could ship from a factory. You know, we took this uh, idea of building appliances because selling software and infrastructure in the early days was very hard. You could never protect value. Everybody looks at you as a non-branded company. Nobody wants to support you because it's always your problem, not their problem on the hardware itself. So you have to brute force build this market by protecting the value in, 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 in an appliance. And one of the big advices that I got from one of, one of the Thai members who, who I really look up to, his name is B.V. Jagdish, and he gave me some really, um, you know, sort of observations that, that you could look at as mundane, but they're extremely strategic in packaging and pricing and things like that. He's like, you protect value like this, and over time you can figure out whether you want to, uh, you know, really take the software out and sell software later on. And obviously we had seen some of this movie because VMware could not build its, uh, its own business without really selling off to EMC. It was really, really hard to build an infrastructure software business without distribution, without the umbrella, and doing building sales and marketing engine itself. So if we had to not sell this business, we had to figure out a way to really brute force build a distribution. And none of these big guys would actually support us because nobody's asking for it. And they only look at uh, these heat maps to say how many customers ask for it, it's like 0.01%, it's uninteresting. So we took that distribution, that packaging, that bundling into our hands, and we built this appliance business, which is now turning into software through some of these partnerships now. But, um, so yeah, VMware basically you know, uh, took the ability away for shipping a free operating system from the factory. And they thought this is it because you know their biggest uh, thing is ease of use. And if these guys can't make it easy to install and deploy and run it, make it up and running in 15 minutes, it's going to be hard for them to survive. But again, I think you know serendipity is a big part of any good business. And you know we had uh, one thing that we've done well is to really uh, nurture people who are like extremely rational in the way they think. They're like, you know what? We'll compete with them if that's what it means. Now it means a lot of things. This is. 2013, 2014, VMware could do no wrong, by the way. Uh, Sanjog is sitting here and he'd probably attest to some of these things and he was at EMC and knows a lot of these VMware folks very closely. Uh, but, uh, so what we did was, we did similar to what Microsoft had to do in the 80s. Basically, Apple was upon them, like Apple was cocky and arrogant and these guys were like apps company building something on top of Apple. The PC was done, it was all about Apple and the whole stack. Yeah, you were a little, you know, whatever, uh, productivity software company on top of Apple or something. And then they took a decision to really build their own operating system. They said, look, we will build our own operating system and we want to own, control our own destiny. And something similar has actually happened in our space as well. I think we had to take control of our destiny. They said, we'll build the whole stack ourselves because we can't be at the mercy of somebody who just wants to come and kill us. So we took... Uh, an open source version of uh, the operating system and we've really made it into what we call AHV today. It's Acropolis, AHV. And uh, again, we didn't try to be yet another VMware. We said, look, there's no point trying to sell a generic hypervisor because that hopefully is a new commodity. So can we tuck it in? Can we just make it transparent, invisible, where you don't need a lot of budget and a lot of people to manage that piece, which eventually has gone on to build this mission that we have is like make everything transparent, make everything invisible because eventually most technology becomes a means to an end, not an end in itself. Like it happened to storage, it's happening to virtualization, where virtualization was a strategy for a CIO. Now they're like, look, it's a means to an end, cloud runs with virtualization, so why do you really care about buying virtualization software and things like that? And in the next uh, three to five years, we think that the cloud itself will be a means to end, not an end in itself. The idea of renting infrastructure will not be an end in itself. So what does it mean to tuck that in? Can you make that invisible like the way iCloud is to iPhone? So can you really go and meld these two worlds together where people will own and people can rent, but there's so much of goodness in this uh, convergence of public and private 
that people wouldn't really just think of taking a side which is either own or rent itself. So there's a lot of work ahead for us. We have, at least we have defined convergence of uh, on-prem infrastructure. How do you bring all that stuff into pure software? But there's a convergence of a different kind that we have to now do that basically belongs to two different domains. One is public cloud, one is the private cloud. Bring it together, make it look like one. So that stuff is another five years worth of a journey, at least for us, you know, and we'll see whether we succeed or not. Now, um, the other question that I see here is, particular market, decide which one to focus on, what strategies work. I think you know, it's always important to uh, look for uh, you know, at least one workload, and I know this is kind of preaching to most of you folks. Uh, you pick one workload and you do a good job of it. You know, and the workload that we picked was quite contrarian, as uh, you know, Preeti can attest to. But we picked something that uh, was actually Looks like people are getting tired. I can see that from the alarm system here. Uh, you picked a workload that was, uh, that was relatively hard to achieve. And you know, I think I can talk about some of the stuff. It's a longer drawn discussion about strategy. You pick one workload. You do a good job of this. It starts to pay your bills. And if you have the ambition, you won't be a niche company. You'll actually get into other things, which is what we've done over time. You know, that one workload that we started out with is now probably 20 25% of our business. But it's the one that actually really kept the lights on in the business. And you know, we got initial customers, they, they paid our bills, they said, you can, I'll pay you more if you do more. So we've done a pretty good job of customer loyalty. I mean, our net promoter score is probably the best in the industry. It's uh, an NPS of 92. And as you know, the scale is minus 100 to plus 100. There's no IT company in the face of this earth that has an NPS of 92. And, and that just goes back to this idea of customer loyalty and, and repeat business and so on. And we share a lot of these numbers publicly as well, talk about what customer loyalty actually means to us. So uh, I think we've done a fairly OK job, but uh, I think time will tell us to whether we do have the staying power to be in this business or not. You know, and there's some, it's a red ocean. The, the space that we're in is basically uh, it's a very large market. Infrastructure is a very, very large market. There's a lot of sharks. and. The goal is whether we can be the shark that's the most nimble, that's most agile, that's you know, basically changing our course based on the direction. And uh, I think uh, the biggest test is ahead of us, just like it was when I entered IIT. And the real, real drama, the real fun only had begun in my career. So this is very much like that. And uh, I, I believe that there's a lot more that uh, you will come and ask questions on in the next coming years. So thank you so much for everything. Take the last question. Dheeraj, will you take one more question? Or? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm okay, actually, as long as people have the patience to actually No, absolutely. Everybody's having a wonderful monologue. time and first of all, thank you. I mean, we can take a uh, couple of questions as long as uh, there's something that uh, everybody else will actually benefit from. Yes, sir. Let me just bring the mic to you. So that yeah, the question is, uh, as you become a public company, how does it change your talent acquisition strategy? Um, I think it's back to the same basics, actually. You know, you got to continue to innovate and, and uh, you know, we really do mo everything with full-time employees. We have, we have employees in 45 countries right now. Uh, we have uh, more than 26, 2,700 employees in the company. And they're hubs, you know, we have a hub in San Jose that's where about 60% uh, of the R&D is. Uh, we started India about two years ago, two, three years ago. India is about 20% of the R&D right now uh, in Bangalore. And uh, we have another 20% in Seattle and Durham. So there's like four centers and now Cambridge is building up because we got some really good talent. And it looks like Cambridge will be a fifth hub for R&D. And uh, we have some really good support centers. You know, as I said, you know, we have you know, customers in 90 countries, so we need to actually have local support. So we have some great support in the US, in San Jose and Durham, and some awesome support in Amsterdam. A Amsterdam is a pretty big hub for us as well. Uh, Sydney, Tokyo, and Beijing. So you know, we basically have a very distributed strategy for talent. You have to go and tap talent in these five countries. And there's uh, three countries for engineering, and basically in sales around the world, actually. Yes, sir. You know, you, you touched on the cloud uh, as a growth potential. Do you see five years from now, uh, with all the cybersecurity concerns, we 
we have a huge uh, cyber attack and where for some reason corporate data is revealed and a lot of bad information comes out. Hmm. Yeah, the question is, uh, does security uh, become a bigger issue to the point where cloud will be threatened? Now, the answer is uh, probably not. You know, I think ease of use trumps everything. So if you look at uh, the idea of Apple, Apple phones, uh, iPads and iOS uh, uh, making their way into the enterprise, so because most people in 2011 were actually completely scoffing at Apple. They're like, look, this is a toy for the home and it's for the consumers, but Apple will never make it to the enterprise, right? Security was a big reason. BlackBerry had security. It was like top of the notch uh, security stuff for emails and things like that. But it was such a hard thing to use. I mean, the device was a nightmare compared to what Apple had actually built. And ease of use penetrates everything, and security takes care of itself. So I believe personally that all this fud about security, that, oh, it's going to be one of those things, is actually going to make cloud shrink. Uh, I think the cloud will not shrink. The pendulum will come and rest in the middle. People will own things, people will rent things, and those that will do a great job of melding the two probably will have a really good chance, actually. Yeah. So yes, we have one last question. Uh, excuse me, please, uh, pardon me for interrupting you. Uh, there's been a lot of people that submitted questions ahead of time, and they didn't get a chance to present their questions. Uh, so Karpakam, can you please pick one question? So the question here, what is the one book everybody should read in their lifetime? So the one book, I, I'm not a, like an uh, avid reader of a lot of books. I read a lot of you know, things that are probably two pages, articles and things like that. I'm a great believer in, in advisors. So some great advisors that I have in my, who teach me about mindfulness, who teach me about authenticity, who teach the company about these things. So Mike Robbins is a great uh, advisor to the company. He talks about authenticity and should go and take a read on what his ideas on being authentic are. Uh, mindfulness is another thing that I'm you know, learning about every day. I'm not very good at it when I go home and I have my cell phone in front of me when, when the kids are asking for something. Uh, it's not being mindful, so I'm learning to do that. You talked about, Ram talked about how I keep my phone away when I'm in meetings. It's, it's important for me to actually just focus on that one thing well as opposed to trying to be all things to all people in those, uh, in those meetings. Uh, the book that I really, really like uh, that I'm sure most of you actually have read is called Only the Paranoid Survive. It's, I mean, I could read that book 10 times and never feel, and it talks about the journey, the saga of Intel and the highs and lows, the resilience of the company. I mean, Andy Grove talks about how he was on the verge of being fired from that company along with Gordon Moore actually, you know. So um, uh, I think, uh, and they talk about this, you know, it's like, look, we look out the window of the Great America Parkway and we're thinking, what would the board do when they fire us? They'll bring a new CEO who'll get out of the memory business because they had been killed by the Japanese uh, in those 10 years that they were in. So, you know, again, I, I have a cognitive bias. I read books that talk about resilience, that talk about anti-fragility. That's the other thing that we are embracing in the company, the idea of anti-fragile. There's, uh, and now he's a complex author, so it's going to be hard for you to follow the book, but if you follow the first 50 pages of the, of the book, Anti-Fragile, you'll get a lot out of it. You'll have to you know, basically practice it every day, but the idea is powerful, it's beautiful. He's the same author who's written books called Black Swan and uh, uh, Fool by Randomness. His name is Nicholas uh, Nassim Taleb, and he has come to our conferences, and we interact a lot with him. But he talks about this concept of anti-fragility, which means that he says there's a spectrum. And by the way, I like these authors who have talked about a continuum or a spectrum, because Mike Robbins also talks about a continuum. He talks about a spectrum. He says on the left of this is fragile systems. You know, it's a couple, you know, you drop it, it breaks. In the middle is actually resilient systems, which means that resilience is not good enough. And so what does he mean by resilience? He's like, look, resilience means the system after a shock will go back to where it came from. And then he says the, the real goodness and the best systems are anti-fragile systems. They actually get better after a shock. And that's such a mind-boggling, profound concept that a shock makes you better something. You know? So he talks a lot about that. You know, beyond the 50 pages, I, mean, I, interact, I tell him, uh, Nicholas, you write difficult books that are very hard to follow. And his answer is, look, you're only supposed to read the first 55, 60 pages, and then you can go back over the life of the book and read more of it as you look at case studies and use cases. He talks about healthcare and many such things which you can take 40 years to read and it'll still be a new book. 
Uh, and, and the same thing that Mike Robbins is another continuum that I love. I love this continuum that he talks about, which is more on the other softer side. He said, the left of the spectrum in this authenticity is dishonest people. It's just slime balls you don't want to deal with, you don't want to be around, and so on. And he says, the middle of the continuum is honest people, which basically is uh, you know, somewhat uh, sort of, uh, I would say, unexpected to say that, look, honesty is not good enough. And he actually talks about how you need to take something out of honesty and add something to honesty to make it truly authentic. So he talks about taking out self-righteousness and adding a very important word called vulnerability. Like, you know, if you become vulnerable, you're more powerful than when you're not. So, uh, so we're trying to understand vulnerability in the company, myself. What does vulnerability mean? And in fact, I'm so passionate about the word vulnerability that uh, there's a really good TED speaker, another one like Mike Robbins. Her name is Brene Brown. And uh, she probably has the highest score of any TED talk that has ever been given. She talks about vulnerability and she talks about courage and how vulnerability and courage are actually mingled together. So uh, if, if I succeed in, in signing up her as an advisor, she'll really spend a lot of time with us, talk about courage and talk about vulnerability as you build this company itself. So, yeah, I think there's some great uh, advisors around us, and they've written some awesome books. And Brené herself has written a couple of really good books as well. But as a company and as myself, I'd love to learn more about these concepts to really build the staying power that can build a larger company from here. Okay? Thank, Thank you, you very much, Dheeraj. What an absolutely fantastic evening today. I'd like to particularly thank these little darlings that have been so patient uh, for 90 minutes looking at Daddy on the stage, but not bothering him. And thanks again, Dheeraj. Uh, so you could connect with Dheeraj through Dipti Desai, our programs director, if you have any specific domain, uh, specific event, uh, questions. So I'd close this evening with wishing Dheeraj more power and more success. Uh, if, if you don't know, he is ranked number 66 out of 100,000 tech influencers worldwide. So, you know, I, I hope to see him in the top 10. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you.